society within our academic order. Well, welcome everybody. Uh, it's really nice to have a full room here uh, to join us for our fourth Athena lecture series. Um, and if you're thinking what that picture is behind me, this is not a series dedicated to the goddess Athena. Well, although the goddess Athena is sort of our uh, emblem for it, but it's a series of 15 distinguished lectures, uh, distinguished professors from different universities uh, are giving talks in 2017 and 2018. And this is the fourth one in the series. Uh, and if you would like to find some more about it, you can also mail us through the Center of Future Places or you can talk to our communications director. Uh, my name is Tigran Haas, and I am the director of the Center for the Future Places, um, interdisciplinary research platform and institute at the School of Architecture and the Built Environment. Um, I'm also an associate professor at the Department of Urban Planning and Environment. So today we have a um, uh, special privilege to welcome, I think, a person who has been here in Sweden a few times, and that we in Sweden particularly like, and is very popular here, Professor Sharon Zukin. Um, and Professor Sharon Zukin is a professor of sociology at Brooklyn College at CUNY, Center, uh, uh, City University of New York, Graduate Center. She's author of many books, and I put on this poster some of the seminal works, and some of you might remember some of them, especially The Loft Living, a breakthrough book. Uh, that was your first book, I think. First urban book. First urban book yeah. uh, that I think a lot of us have used, and it was um, by, it's cited around 1,003 300 times in Google. Google and and that's really amazing because I have only sold three copies. <laughs> <laughs> they were very valuable copies, yeah. So uh, Professor Zukin is an author, as I said, on books on cities, culture, and consumer culture, but also a researcher on urban culture and economic change. She was a Brooklydian professor from 96 to 2008, and she received the Lind Award for Career Achievement in Urban Sociology from the American Sociological Association and the C. Wright Mills Book Award for Landscapes of Power. You've been a visiting professor in a number of places, especially in Amsterdam, and a distinguished fellow in Advanced Research Collaborative at CUNY Graduate Center. You are a fan of Jane Jacobs, but you're also a critic of Jane Jacobs, and you, I would guess you're only a critic of Richard Florida, not a big fan. <laughs> uh, but the, the, really, the, um, your books trace how cities have been reshaped through deindustrialization, de gentrification, and immigration. These are the sort of the three things that really come through all of your work. Uh, also, the rise of the symbolic economy, which is based on culture production and consumption. So, um, without any further ado, I'm really happy that you are going to be our fourth speaker now, and I will give you the floor, Sharon. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, many thanks to uh, the Center for the Future of Place, Cities, Cities, Center for Future of Cities, uh, KTH, Professor Tigran Haas, uh, for inviting me to Stockholm uh, and enabling me to experience the city in its cold weather glory. Uh, I have been to Stockholm several times, but usually to conferences. So I have only seen the inside of conference rooms. Uh, on this trip, I have a chance to see the streets, and that's been very good for me so far. Um, I'm going to speak to you today about uh, research that I have done on, uh, I need to move the cursor in some way, and there must be, ah, thank you for the mouse, uh, research that I've done on local shopping streets, which represents a, uh, a, a, a different sort of research project. Um, for the Athena lecture, and for all of us Athenas, who are here today, I want to mention three basic starting points of the research project. Number one, shopping even today is identified primarily with women. And for that reason, it is devalued. Even in sociology, which has a lot of women practitioners and theorists, when people heard that I was doing research on shopping streets, they didn't hear the word streets. They heard the word shopping, and they said, oh, that could not be very important. 
So even though men do a lot of shopping, uh, especially online shopping on the internet, uh, shopping in general is devalorized because it's associated with women rather than with men. Number two, whoever thinks about local shopping streets, I mean, maybe you go to buy something on a local shopping street, but you have in mind you're going to a particular shop, or maybe you go to a cafe or a restaurant, but whoever thinks about the shopping street, it's not what we call in social science a unit of analysis, and it's not even a place that most people think of as a coherent place. We tend to take that urban space for granted. And especially among my fellow or sister urban theorists, um, there's a lot of talk about these big abstracts like planetary urbanization and global cities. Nobody ever looks at the very specific everyday spaces that we walk through and use. Oops, I think I have to go back. To, oh, and then globalization. This research project also began, begins with an observation that all of us can make when we travel from city to city. And we notice the same types of shops, the same types of cafes, uh, the same global brands in every city. Are all st shopping streets becoming the same? Is there a very strong process of cultural homogenization that comes with globalization. So these are three starting points for my research project, which I began actually uh, seven years ago when I was finishing writing about authenticity in the book Naked City. I said, now I want to have a different kind of research project. I want to have some fun. I want to travel. I don't want to write about New York anymore. Uh, I want to write about local shopping streets in different cities of the world. My conclusion after seven years of thinking about local shopping streets is to cite the famous Russian novel Anna Karenina. All shop, or to paraphrase and change it a little bit, all shopping streets are alike, but each shopping street is very specific in its own way. In order to get the feel of local shopping streets, you have to have local knowledge. You have to be able to speak the language. You have to know the history of different cities. You have to discover the specific history of different streets. So it took me about one year, but I recruited people whom I knew to join me in a transnational comparative research project. I took two cities in North America, New York and Toronto, two cities in Europe, uh, Amsterdam and Berlin, and two cities in East Asia, Shanghai and Tokyo. You know, I could have chosen two other cities in Europe. Don't feel bad, Stockholm, that you are not in this uh, in this sample. Uh, it was, you know, to some degree um, coincidence or chance that uh, I recruited Amsterdam and and Berlin um, to be in my European sample. Uh, but what was important was to have representation from three different areas where the, um, the cities have a, a high level of economic development and the European and North American cities have high levels of transnational migration. Shanghai has a very high rate of domestic migration. Tokyo does not have such a uh, a high rate of uh, in-migration, either from other regions of Japan or other regions of the world. However, Tokyo has much more migration now than uh, it has had in previous years, at least migration from other countries. 
And of course, we produced a book eventually after three meetings together in New York and Amsterdam and Shanghai, and a lot of consultation by email and sharing of questions and findings and documents, and a lot of repressive hand-on editorial work by the three of us, whose names are on the front of the book. We produced this book, which was published last year in English by Routledge and in Chinese translation by Tongji University Press. So if you look around at the shopping streets in our research project, you see they look the same, right? You have indoor stores with plate glass windows. Sometimes you have products in the street, sometimes you don't. And you have people walking on the street, sometimes pushing their baby carriages on the street and looking in the shop windows. Isn't this a universal urban form. Uh, but you also see these very specific signs of local identity. Now, you don't know when you're walking on the street who lives inside the apartments. You can't look inside the windows. If you look at census data about the population, you only know who sleeps in a district. But if you look at the exterior space, which is a public space of the street, you get a pretty good sense of who lives in the area, what is the history of the area, and what city and what specific district you are in. On this street in Amsterdam, Utrechtstraat, which is the street where I did research, one of the streets where I did research, you see, first of all, the architecture of the buildings. These buildings, most of them, were built in the 17th century. The facades of many of them were renovated in the early 20th century. This street is part of a UNESCO World Heritage Site, which certifies the, um, the architectural beauty of the ensemble. And it's, it's a World Heritage Site that includes the entire canal belt of Amsterdam. And Utrechtsestraat is one of two major shopping streets at either end, the northern end and the southern end of the canal belt. But then you look at the tracks in the middle of the street, and you see these are tram tracks or trolley tracks that could only signify several streets in Europe. Yes, Stockholm too, I guess, but definitely not a North American street. And then you see those five red f storefronts. Oops, now can I go back? Uh, can I get a cursor or a pointer, right, a clicker? Yes, pointer. Uh, there's a clicker somewhere, a pointer somewhere? In your left hand. This hand. one, yeah. okay, so I have to touch something else. In the middle. Uh, maybe this? Ah, this makes life easy, okay. So if you look at these, these stores, maybe you say, oh, it's the same type of store. But if you really know, you see this is concerto. It's pronounced concerto in Dutch. This is concerto. That is the second oldest music shop in Amsterdam. Uh, the license for this shop was granted in 1952, and it was the second shop in the city to sell phonograph records and um, I want to say stereo sets, but the, the, they did not exist then. Uh, phonograph, phonographs, yes, phonographs and, pho and phonograph records. And now there are five shops, there are four in this block and one in another block um, that sell different music products. Each one of the storefronts specializes in a different music product. And people come to this shop from all over the Amsterdam region on Saturday afternoon if they collect old vinyl records or new forms of music. It's true that uh, Concerto has been threatened because of um, downloads of 
uh, of online uh, uh, music, streaming services, but uh, the store has developed different kinds of services and activities, like concerts in the shop on Sunday afternoon, uh, selling things at, at concerts in other places. Uh, they have a cafe in the shop to make to keep the shop relevant. But again, if you're if if you know how to read the facades, you understand this is a historic shop for the city of Amsterdam. And then, of course, we have the Bach feats. We have the parent we, uh, uh, transporting children in the expensive bicycle. Uh, so altogether, when you look at at this. Uh, ensemble of, of signs and symbols, you know, this is a high status part of the canal belt in Amsterdam. And you know it because it's the public space of the street that has been formed over time by many different cultural processes. The shopping street is also well, if the shopping street is a space of historical tradition and aesthetic coherence, it is also a space of diversity. And it is becoming more diverse with increases in transnational migration. These days, we are all living in societies where transnational migration is threatened by political controls. But for the past 20 or 30 years, we have seen local shopping streets become more diverse. There are people wearing different clothes, speaking different languages, selling different products. It's, it's uh, sort of ironic that on, oops, wrong, wrong button. It's sort of ironic that in uh, some shopping streets in Amsterdam and here in, uh, in Berlin, for example, the names of the streets, which date from the early 20th century, actually reflect the current population. But that was not the way the streets were designed in the first place. But you also see uh, diversity being translated from one urban environment to another so that you have a neighborhood where we did uh, some of our local shopping street research, Bedford Stuyvesant in Brooklyn, where the cultural influences, at least in this particular uh, roti sandwich shop, uh, are uh, regionally diverse. But the name of the neighborhood is then uh, transposed to Amsterdam, where it takes on quite a different meaning that has nothing to do with India or with the Caribbean, but a lot to do with a, uh, a hipster understanding of Brooklyn, which is not necessarily a ref a, an accurate reflection of the real Bedford Stuyvesant in Brooklyn. So we have to think of this space as a street. It's a means of mobility from one place to another. We have to think of the space in terms of the activities of shopping, but we also have to think of it as a place for the social production and consumption of local identity. So a shopping street has very little to do with shopping, and it's not just a place for people to exchange money for goods. It's a space of social and cultural activity. Now we have some interesting paradoxes. On the one hand, as we have seen, a local shopping street is a universal urban form. You find it in every city, even going back in time to ancient cities. But it is also a place where you see local identity. It's a place where you meet strangers and you find products associated with others. And yet, if you live near there or you go there often, you feel at home. It's a, it's a comfortable place. 
It's a space where diversity is produced every day, and yet it's also a space where cultural exchanges take place. So with all of this fascination, local shopping streets should be doing very well. However, economically, they face three big challenges. Number one, products and crafts become obsolete. For example, what are you wearing on your feet? Are you wearing athletic shoes? If you're wearing Nikes or Pumas or Adidas, maybe you never take them to the shoe repair shop. When you wear them out, you throw them away. So what happens to the local shoe repair shop? Or what about Concerto in Amsterdam and the vinyl records? Like, who's buying vinyl records? You have to go to a special shop to buy vinyl records these days. Uh, there are lots of, of, or photo studios. I actually passed a photo studio in, in uh, Soder, Sodermalm today, but uh, the photo studios in my neighborhood in New York have gone out of business because people just take their own digital photos today. They don't go to a photo studio. So, uh, and if you go back in time, of course, there were shops in Shanghai that sold hot water, but you don't need them anymore because people can boil their own water or turn on the faucet to get warm water in their home. Or there were shops in all cities that sold coal or ice cubes, but we have refrigerators, we have uh, central heating today. You don't need that kind of, of shop. So obsolescence, economic obsolescence of products and crafts, that's a very strong challenge that the spaces of shopping streets face. Also challenge from chain stores, large format stores, especially stores like um, Ikea that locate, or Walmart, that locate on the periphery of cities and have big parking lots. Who wants to shop uh, for a washing machine or a sofa on their local shopping street? Uh, maybe there are no stores on local shopping streets anymore that sell sofas or that sell washing machines or televisions. And then, of course, there's the big existential danger online shopping. Who buys books in a bookshop when you can buy books cheaper on the Amazon? Who buys a computer in a computer store when you can buy it cheaper online? So online shopping has posed a huge existential danger to local shopping streets. And all of, all of these three are economic challenges. Nonetheless, there are limitations and interesting things to study when you look at these spaces. These are spaces made up of privately owned businesses. And yet, we feel that those businesses inside and the street outside are free to everyone to enter. Um, they are subject to local government laws and policing, but we feel that we have a right to be there. The people who own the businesses and the people who own the buildings act in their own self-interest, usually their economic self-interest, yet they create the sense of local identity that we consume. The forms of the buildings, the experiences people have on the street create a kind of cultural heritage, but it has no recognition as culture, and no respect as cultural heritage. And again, as my research partners and I say, local shopping streets are very important spaces where we learn to live with others who are different from us. 
The role of migration, especially transnational migration, as I said before, in most of the cities that we have studied is gigantic. Many, many shop owners today come from other countries. However, in Chinese cities and in history, in all cities, most small shop owners come from the countryside. So that even in the 1950s or the early 1900s, the local shop owners who created a sense of neighborhood, of local districts, they came from outside of New York or London or Tokyo. And this is the paradox, maybe the most important paradox of these spaces that forces us to acknowledge the important contribution of migrants to creating the city. But do we really see diversity or are we just consuming the signs of diversity? When you look at streets that have gone through a similar process that I like to call gentrification by hipster, you find the same brands and the same kinds of clothing. Is that just superficial consumption of difference? Or is it something real? For example, the shop in, oh, ah, clicker, clicker. For example, the shop in Amsterdam here, the name of the shop is Dief. And when I asked the owner of the shop, why did you choose this name? He said, it stands for diversity, and I like diversity. But you have to bear in mind that his shop represents a gentrification of the street and a displacement of the migrant shopkeepers who were there before. So what does it mean that he likes diversity when he himself has been an agent of de diversification or removing some of the diversity of the street and returning to uh, a, a street where native-born Dutch people are the shop owners. Nonetheless, let's just take a history lesson from local shopping streets. We can look at the shops and see exactly how the economy changes. Even though the building type remains the same, and this is not a picture of ex the same building, but the building type, you can see the narrow uh, doorway, the, the, uh, the, the facade with the two doors, one to the residential part, one to the store, uh, and the window, the, that's a you know, 17th century Amsterdam building type, uh, remains the same, but the local shop owner and his children have been replaced by some young person behind the counter. The, lang the type of shop, even though they're both selling food, is entirely different. Uh, these are uh, sort of old-fashioned words for grocery store that are no longer used in, in Dutch. And here we have this combination of English and uh, made-up word oodles, oodles of noodles, and uh, probably we have a very different sort of customer in the, in the shop. We can also see the trendiness of neighborhoods, the change of tastes uh, in, the, in the recent past. This is the same, the, these are photos of the same street corner. Uh, on the Lower East Side of Manhattan, where uh, until recent years, most of the stores sold cheap clothing. And I really, I, I actually really loved the aesthetics of the, uh, of the 
goods hanging outside and the owners sitting on the corner. But for the past few years, it's been a Mexican restaurant that has nothing to do with the history of the neighborhood. The chef of the restaurant uh, comes from uh, San Francisco, and he is uh, very prominent in social media for his, um, his, uh, his, his uh, fusion cuisine. And it's a very different, you know, just looking at the, at the, at the presence of, of uh, businesses on the street shows how tastes have changed. Uh, you can also see from looking at our other research site in a majority uh, black neighborhood, African American and Caribbean neighborhood of Brooklyn, how the, uh, the population has changed and the dominant uh, uh, the dominant aesthetic has changed, not 100%, uh, but uh, significantly from, uh, from cheap stores to a, a precious kind of, uh, again, hipster uh, aesthetic. In Shanghai, you see another very dramatic change on one of our shopping streets. Uh, before uh, the uh, revolution of 1949, uh, there were people selling things, uh, food and hot water, uh, on, uh, in front of uh, uh, housing and workshops in pretty bad physical condition. Um, in the early 2000s, there were people uh, living in, living in these spaces. Uh, around 1990, because of economic reforms in China, people who had been renting their apartments uh, because the enterprise that they worked for uh, uh, bought the buildings and gave them the right to rent the apartment, they were able to buy their apartments for relatively cheap prices. So by 2004, you s saw that people were living in these, in these buildings and they were still workers. After 2006, this area became, yes? After 2006, this area became uh, an arts district, uh, at first Ill illegally and then with recognition and legality from the city government, and you had a lot of these uh, boutiques together with artist studios and art galleries and cafes. Uh, in, in four or five years, the people who owned the apartments and were charging very high rents realized that they could charge even higher rents. So some of the art businesses moved out, and then a lot of souvenir shops and different kinds of mass market stores moved into the area, which is filled with customers, particularly on, on weekends. But the, the, the sense of, the very short sense of the uh, area as a cultural space is just about finished, but also the earlier period of time when these were, uh, these spaces were workers' housing and fact, very small factories, that time period is finished too. So that this area of local shopping streets also is a text of modern Chinese, especially modern Shanghainese history. So, even though I began saying that this is a very specific, very empirical research project, in fact, we can see huge structural processes of change by looking carefully at local shopping streets over time so that we see economic values changing in terms of rents rising. We see the various dislocations of transnational migrants creating new kinds of concentrations of shops and ethnic districts. We see tastes changing reflected in the aesthetic signs of the street, which we read with our eyes and our brains. And then, of course, we see different functions clustering together, which creates cultural enclaves and specialized concentrations of shops. 
Now let's become really analytic and imagine that we are Henri Lefebvre trying to analyze the local shopping street. So I have adapted his, uh, his three categories of space so that we can talk about a local shopping street as a structured space, as a lived space, and as an imagined space. So here's the structured space. There are three groups of people at the center who create the, the ecosystem of the shopping street. Uh, sure, there are the store owners and the shoppers, but another key group is the building owners who decide what kinds of shops to rent to. And then we have all of the logistics and business arrangements and social networks and cultural networks that bring different kinds of goods and products to the street. So that, for example, uh, a supply chain that brings uh, shoes made in China to a shopping street is very different from a supply chain that brings uh, freshly roasted coffee beans from a single origin field in Guatemala to the shopping street. A different, a different atmosphere, a different character, a different local identity is put in place by the supply chains. And then we have the policies of local government, national government too, particularly national government policies on immigration and taxes but local policies that have to do with social controls of immigration, social controls of disadvantaged population, um, local policies on taxes, local policies on policing, local policies on parking on the street. Uh, a lot of local government policies shape the future of the local shopping street. And uh, as, as we will see in a few minutes, in some cities, not so much in New York, but a lot in Amsterdam, uh, the desire of local government to clean a street and to remove all uh, symbols of ghettos from the street results in very significant changes on the street. So local government is even though it might be invisible on the street, it's very, very important. And then, of course, we have the people who live around the local shopping street. Most often, but not always, they are the largest group of shoppers on the street. Their needs and their tastes determine who will be the successful business owners on the local street. Uh, and then we have the media, which more and more these days, especially social media, write about the street and uh, feature reviews of the street and reviews of different businesses on the street so that even before we visit the street, we have a sense of what kind of street it is and will we like it. Uh, not part of this research project, but in a different research project that I did with two of my graduate students, we analyzed restaurant reviews on Yelp, a review website uh, that's very popular in the US. And we saw that the re restaurant reviews in a predominantly black neighborhood and a predominantly white neighborhood were quite different in the way they represented the, neighbor, the two neighborhoods. We were trying to see whether race and racism uh, were represented in something as innocent as restaurant reviews. And we found, yes, uh, yes, race, restaurant reviews could be implicitly um, oriented to race and racism. We pub if, if you're interested, ask me afterwards, uh, because we published that, that article separately from this other research. Uh, so the media also are very important in shaping the structure 
of the ecosystem of the street, what's on it and what's not on it. And then the lived space has to do with people's experience of the space, their bodily experience, their experience in terms of social networks, the way people react to the aesthetics of the street. Uh, middle class people in the United States um, often say, oh, that street is, quote, interesting, or that street is not interesting. And they use the word interesting to represent uh, their cultural uh, identity with or their cultural um, distance from the people who use that street. And that language of interesting or not interesting also reflects the uh, prejudices of cl social class and race. Um, I found out when I did interviews in Amsterdam that people have a very strong memory of experiences they have had on different shopping streets from when they were children. And it's, you know, it's, it's, it's really interesting to hear people, people talk about how their mother or their father took them to shop on that street. That has some influence on their experience of the street today. Or, for example, that street Utrechtsestraat in Amsterdam, where I did uh, my interviews, um, it's a very lovely upscale street today. But I found out from talking to people who have lived there for a long time that until the, from, let's say, from the 1960s until the 1980s, it was a street where prostitutes did their business. You may know that in Amsterdam, prostitution is legal inside, but prostitution of people walking on the street is not legal. So that was a street where there was illegal prostitution and the store owners who had been there in the 1980s and some residents who had been there for a long time remembered what it was like when there were prostitutes and drug dealers there and what a contrast it is with the street today. So all of these things are, just to give you those two examples, uh, all of these things are just so important. Also in, in the street on, uh, in, on Fulton Street in Bedford-Stuyvesant, there's a, a, an old theater which just now, after many years, is being renovated. It was called for maybe 20 years the Slave Theater because the owner wanted to, uh, uh, to dramatize the history of racism in the United States there. But uh, uh, just knowing that it was called the Slave Theater recalls earlier times when that neighborhood was not a, not a safe neighborhood, and it was it was uh, and, and and even an earlier time when there were jazz clubs in that neighborhood, which there have not been for you know forty or fifty years. Um, and also, as my friend Suzanne Hall at the London School of Economics frequently writes, uh, local shopping streets are spaces where you learn to recognize cultural others as having dignity. And you learn, as you go into shops owned by people who come from other cultural groups, you learn to be civil in these spaces. By the same token, in New York and other US cities, and in London too, there have been riots, there have been conflicts, there have been fights between residents of one ethnic group and store owners of a different ethnic group. So the civility of a local shopping street sometimes has to be, or I should say, sometimes has been fought. It's, it's, a, it's a social achievement, perhaps, to have civility on a local shopping street. When I spoke about social media a few minutes ago, I suggested that shopping streets are streets that we imagine also. We think about them, but we don't really articulate, express explicitly what we're thinking. When I did interviews in Amsterdam and I asked people, 
So describe Utrecht's Strat to me. Uh, sometimes they would say, well, it's not Harlemer Strat or it's not some other street. So I thought this was strange. If I say to you, what is this street like? You say, well, it's not that street. But th these people were expressing a very relational understanding of urban spaces as being distinctive. And they would say, well, this space is not that space. They're, they're quite different spaces. Um, uh, does, is, this, is this a differentiation that is continued, uh, even though we have so many reproductions of global brands and chains in one street after another? I, d I, d I don't know whether this will continue to be the case in the, um, in the future. And then again, the, the social media representations of streets really create very strong images that we react to in a physical and an economic sense. So in all of the cities that we studied, uh, it's interesting, in the early 2000s, there was an intensification of redevelopment. Sometimes the redevelopment came more from the market. Sometimes it came more directly from local government. Uh, and you could see th th the change uh, coming by looking at the, the aesthetics of the stores, the way the stores look. Um, you would see what I like to call the ABCs of gentrification with more artsy kinds of, of shops. And you, you know, would look inside the shop, or you would look inside the cafe, and all of the guys would be wearing short sleeve black T-shirts, which was actually the case uh, in the cafe where I had lunch today before coming here, um, in Sodermom, uh, where every guy was wearing a short sleeve black T-shirt, and <laughs> they were they were not working on laptops, but they could have been working on laptops too, um, and sometimes these uh, changes in aesthetics really reflect the decisions of building owners who say, well, I, we want to have more upscale stores here. And upscale sometimes means uh, global brands like um, Gucci and, and, and Prada, but sometimes uh, you have kind of the low end of iconic uh, stores with gentrification by hipster. That's, you know, the this is the universal aesthetic that signifies uh, more upscale streets and higher rents. And then, of course, we have uh, uh, decisions made by the local government or by uh, public-private partnerships that may govern the street. Uh, these uh, bids, business improvement districts, are very common in Canada, the U.S., and around the world now. Uh, there are associations of building owners and store owners that in the U.S. Uh, try to raise property values. In other countries, they may, uh, like in, in the Netherlands, for example, they may have other goals. Uh, but they all create a, the same kinds of strategies. In the early 2000s, we saw the global toolkit of creative city strategies, but today we see the global toolkit of upscaling local shopping streets strategies, where a lot of the associations <coughs> of uh, building owners and store owners try to bring in more cultural spaces, different kinds of food spaces to show people that the street is, is better, quote, better than it was. Uh, but what results in almost all of the cities that, uh, that put into place these global redevelopment strategies is the displacement of ethnic minorities and the displacement of new immigrant store owners, which is a very serious problem because it removes economic opportunity uh, from the, the realm of possibility for new immigrants. I know that uh, the round table that we will have tomorrow afternoon will probably uh, touch on some of these issues, uh, entrepreneurship, opportunity, and 
and uh, new immigrants. So what does this look like? This displacement, these aesthetic changes, we have a change from a uh, traditional fusion culture to a very different kind of culture. And this, is, this was not a neighborhood in my study, but I thought it would be a good photograph to show you because many people who visit the United, many young people who visit the United States have friends or cousins who are living in Crown Heights today. Or in uh, the neighborhood in the east of Amsterdam, which has been completely reshaped by changing uh, social housing from rental housing to uh, owner-occupied housing and recruiting different types of shops and shop owners, you have a shift from this kind of music store to this kind of music production and concert space. So then you can legitimately ask, well, who owns this street and who belongs on this street? Who can feel at home on this street in every one of the cities? that we looked at. Who benefits from the changes on the street? And here you can see just a tremendously interesting contrast be oh. between a hair salon owned by a transnational migrant and a hair salon probably owned by a native Dutch person. The new hair salon? the old hair salon right next to each other. Who is going to inherit the street? And what will the city look like when local shopping streets change their identity? So these are some of the observations that I was able to make thanks to my good research partners and thanks to them bringing me to every one of the cities so I could walk on the streets myself and take these, these photographs. But remember that we started with a small, insignificant space, a local shopping street. Is it more important to you now? <laughs> what do you think? So thanks very much for listening to me, and I look forward to hearing what you think. I'll give a few seconds for everything to sink in. <laughs> Thank you very much for this very rich uh, talk. Uh, what we practice in the Athena talks, we have a person that sort of makes a short reflection, a semi-comment and maybe opens up for discussion. This time around, it's my good friend and colleague, Chuck Wolf, uh, an urbanist and a lawyer from Seattle and also an author of two extremely interesting books, Urbanism Without Effort and Seeing the Better City. Seeing the Better City is done sort of in the, in the vein of Excuse William me, White. The name of the second book? Seeing the Better City, Seeing the Better City. I'm giving you now a good uh, promo here. You should all go out and buy the book. So I'll give the word to Chuck to, to make a few, uh, few reflections. You can use the little oh, buggy okay. here. The, the, the great invention. Thank you, Tigran, and um, I agree, Sharon, this is very, very rich. I, um, you know, just by way of context, I, although I'm a, I have been a practicing lawyer for many years. I do have a planning background, and I'm an affiliate um, academic type, too. And so what I, and, and this comment's not about, about yours truly. It's about you, Sharon, because I'm familiar with your earlier work. And um, I, think, I think you sold yourself short with your introduction, that, which was sort of, well, no one really cares about these small spaces, because I think that um, you prove by your conclusion that how important they really are. And whereas my approach to them is very similar to your conclusion, a more inductive approach, um, I come from Seattle, which is so responsible for the Starbucks on every corner and the Microsoft reality and so much that we see in our urban landscapes today. I also opened my own book with a, a commercial storefront in Arusha, Tanzania, and a Starbucks in Seattle, and I like to call it the same photo across the world, because I go and I dissect the interactions between people in place in commercial environments. So this is amazingly um, informative to me to see um, your, your applied approach and your 
uh, really parallel uh, interpretation of cont context, the importance of context, the, the how, how physical forms change based on globalization, based on this post-2005 redevelopment emphasis. So, you know, really, really, really great stuff. And I, I will conclude those laudatory <laughs> comments <laughs> with a question. And that is, one thing that has intrigued me in my parallel world is to see, um, picking up on, on the role of government, and maybe this is the lawyer in me, but you probably are well aware that one city in particular, the most observed city in the modern age, Paris, has taken it, taken it on the issue of preserving the artisanal flavor of a street such as the Rue de Martia, and has identified 50 streets, I believe it is, within the city. You're nodding, so I think I've got my number right. Where, in, in so many words, it's a no net loss approach. Um, such a, such a, um, a store goes away, such a business goes away based on a family retirement or some end of life. No chain store, got to replace it with something similar. And so my question is, do you believe that somehow that is a, is a laudable thing to do? Or should we resign ourselves to the global forces that, um, that are currently affecting the urban dynamic? It goes to your final question. It's like, who does that type of approach serve? And is that really a yuppified? hipster gentrification hiding behind a cultural preservation effort, so. I greatly appreciate your laudatory remarks. Oh, sorry. Do I have to stand up? Okay. Yeah. I greatly appreciate your laudatory remarks. Bring them on, I love laudat <laughs> laudatory remarks. Um, and yes, I, 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 I did uh, try to construct an ironic lecture uh, where we start simply and, and then we discover the, the layers of complexity in a, simple, in a seemingly simple space. Um, I am familiar with uh, the, the uh, policy of the city of Paris that you mentioned, and uh, I am familiar with the work of the public-private organization La Semaest that is responsible for implementing that. Uh, last January, I was lucky to be a speaker at uh, a conference uh, on uh, urban change and urban co commerce, uh, where I had a, a walking tour of the, uh, uh, the part of the 11th arrondissement where La, La Semaest is active, together with a representative of La Semaest. So, um, so the answer to your question is yes and no. Um, I think it, I personally think it's great to reproduce the opportunities for small scale stores individually owned that may sell distinctive products. But uh, the, select, the selection of the businesses may be open and inclusive or closed and exclusive. So a lot depends on the management of that kind of policy. When I had the walking tour of this, uh, 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 this particular part of the, the 10th arrondissement with the representative of La Semaest, I heard a lot of criticism of the, um, what do they call it, the, mon uh, the uh, mo uh, monopoly or mo monotone, monotony of Chinese wholesale garment merchants who had rented a lot of, of storefronts in that area uh, because I guess uh, there was not much demand. I don't remember now why there were a lot of Chinese wholesalers, but the neighbor, a lot of the neighborhood people and La Semaest really wanted to uh, 
to remove those Chinese garment wholesalers and replace them with flower shops or butcher shops or small shops that would cater to cafes, who would cater to uh, the local residents. So, I, I, you know, I, I, that just made me think about the selectivity uh, or the selection process of the businesses. Why, you know, you know, you know, why are some kinds of shops preferred to other kinds of shops? Or, for example, the city of Paris and I guess La Semaest, uh, as well as other organizations, have created uh, a, a preference for young designers and young um, architects and graphic artists to rent st renovated storefronts in neighborhoods that have low income, predominantly um, immigrant populations in Belleville or in um, La Goutte d'Or. Uh, and sometimes those, sometimes those businesses do represent the immigrant population, sometimes they do not. And there's always a, a question about whether those small businesses that are supposed to be artisanal, in fact, are agents of change and agents of displacement. So I think we just have to be very conscious of that the selection process can be guided by certain kinds of cultural and social biases and, you know, maybe, um, maybe there has to be public discussion of what kinds of stores are and what kinds of owners are recruited. By the same token, in a neighborhood like Crown Heights or, or the Lower East Side, there have been demographic changes in the population. For a period of time, you may have a balance in the shops and in the residential population between very different groups what pushes the, the balance to one side or another. You know, in my generation, I, I remember uh, when I was a child, the formative urban experience was the demographic change in many urban neighborhoods from majority white to majority black in very strong racial terms. And uh, there was a, a, an accompanying uh, devalorization of these neighborhoods uh, and various you know uh, conditions that made them risky for financial investment now we have a very different situation where for my students the archetypal ex experience is gentrification or what they call gentrification which raises the property values raises the rents and goes along with very significant demographic changes. So, how do we try to make a balance? Mm -hmm. What kinds of public action are necessary to make a balance? It's a, yeah. it's a Thank question. You. Yeah. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chuck. Uh, yeah, now I have this little blue thing, and I know there's a lot of questions. I see my friend and colleague, Jonathan Metzger. So, Jonathan, I'll just throw this to you. Okay. Oh. oh. Okay, well, that's a cool thing. Uh, well, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Sharon, for a fascinating and very thought-provoking uh, presentation. I've been a fan for many years, I can admit, <laughs> since reading Loft Living as a oh. young PhD student. Oh. Um, but the, the question, I'm, I was wondering if you could develop an aspect of this. And I think the analysis you provide here, it can actually be kind of normatively into urban governance be taken forward actually in two different, very different directions. One is quite a, um, a conservative direction where you say, well, we need to roll things back. We need to go back to where things were before because they were better before. Uh, so we have to, and I'm thinking uh, that's, that's a very obvious way you can take this, but you can also take it in a more radical direction because I think the, the risk that is that there's the, the allure of nostalgia that everything was good before. And I'm thinking of the statistics you present about the degree of, of sort of minority owners of, of uh, uh, laundries and restaurants. And of course, there's a, an analysis to may, be made there that probably there are not other venues available for them for a career, which makes many of them 
go to these uh, kinds of businesses that are open for them. So I was just wondering, I, I'm quite sure from being familiar with your work, what direction you would like to take it, I think. But if you could just uh, uh, expand a little bit on that, how you see that, where you what direction you would like this to go, this analysis, more normatively, and if you have any further ideas about how it could go in such a direction so you don't fall into the allure of nostalgia and trying to roll things back. Well, I, I'm familiar with uh, the criticism of the allure of nostalgia because I wrote about authenticity and a lot of, you know, a lot of people said that um, I was just nostalgic about old, old urban forms and old people and all that stuff. Um, we're, when we talk about shops, we're really talking about private property. In the US, it's very difficult for government to legislate the use of private property. I mean, yes, we have the constitutional principle of eminent domain. I think every society has that, where for the public good, a government can take a, a, a property and compensate the owner financially for that property. But uh, in the US, it's very difficult for a city government to make laws about the use of a, bu a business space. And in New York, at least, but I suspect in, in all um, U.S. cities, uh, local government really does not want to um, to take action against building owners or the real estate industry. The basic, indu uh, I believe, the basic industry in any city is the real estate industry. So no mayor and no city council will really come in and and try to take uh, try to take control of the use of property. So this is all very difficult. I mean, how can you say that? A, a committee of citizens should decide what stores should be on the street. And if local residents today say they want stores A, B, and C, maybe 10 years from now, local residents will say, we don't want A, B, and C, we want something quite, quite different. So I really don't have any easy answers about what, you know, what we should have. However, I do, I, I do feel both emotionally, aesthetically, and uh, sociologically that large-scale ownership and global brands are harmful to developing a sense of local identity and local attachment to place. I also feel, as uh, we've, we've said in the past few minutes, that it's important to have spaces of small-scale ownership available to groups of people who do not have much economic capital. So how can we keep these spaces? How can we keep them viable? Um, I, don't, I don't really know that we can keep them viable against people's tastes but I would like to keep them economically viable. And that's really difficult. The, in New York, it's practically impossible now. The one word that I did not mention or only mentioned once is the word rent. And rents are so high in New York now. Building owners just don't care. And there's no law, no control on commercial rents at the end of a lease the building owner can raise the rent on a store, I mean, 100 times, 1,000 times, you know, whatever the, the building owner wants. And in New York City, the building owners do not care if they keep the store empty for years at a time because they think one day they will get a new store that, or a bank, for example, uh, that will pay the rent that they want. It's very hard to get politicians to take action against this. There was a social movement in the past two years to get the city council in New York to vote on a law that would force building owners and uh, store owners to negotiate rent 
at the end of a lease. This is not even rent control, but just talking to each other. And a very large number of city council representatives signed that they support this law. But at the end of time, the city council president refused to allow the law to come to a vote. Why? The real estate industry is just too strong and too powerful. How, you know, there has to be political will to control that. In some cities of the US, but very few cities, there have been laws made to try to keep small stores available. For example, uh, in a ski town called Park City, Utah, which is also the site of the uh, Sundance Film Festival, there's a law that says no chain stores can open in the center of the town. They have to open on the periphery of the town. In San Francisco, there is some sort of law that prohibits chain stores from, from opening. I'm not sure how that, that operates, but it's not, obviously not going to be a law in New York. Um, what else? Oh, uh, the, the a borough president of Manhattan, who really has been quite active in representing the interests of small business owners, she sponsored a law when she was in the city council to change the zoning laws so that in the district that she represented, new businesses could not have any more than a certain number of meters of storefront. And that practically prevented banks and chain stores from opening in those spaces. So the, the, the legal tools that we have so far are very few and indirect. I leave that to Chuck to come up with a more original solution. <clears throat> Hello, uh, thanks for your talk. Uh, I was thinking when you mentioned the, the challenges uh, that, that local shopping streets are facing, you mentioned like developments like IKEA or out of town <coughs> developments. But I'm thinking from a kind of a suburban context in a country like, or in a city like Stockholm, the, the malls have really, really developed the last say five, 10 years. Uh, in, uh, particularly, I'm thinking of how the indoor malls are now providing public or um, non-commercial, in a sense, space to their users in a much uh, more advanced way than they used to. I mean, I, I guess you, pr you could probably see a similar development in, in some of the US suburbs. I, I don't know the details of that. But I'm thinking of rather large spaces where anyone could sit and charge their phone, uh, work, um, uh, rest without necessarily consuming. I mean, they're still in, within the mall, so it's kind of a consumption space, but they, they've really expanded that and often gen very generous uh, restrooms, nursing rooms, uh, uh, babysitting facilities, uh, exhibition spaces. So how, somehow the, the big privately owned malls really have understood the need for people to not only be consumers all the time, in a sense, uh, uh, and this, I'm thinking, for, particularly for young people, is very attractive. They could go, I mean, they don't have much money, they could go hang out there. This is their social space, <laughs> in a sense. Whereas the local shopping streets have not, I mean, what's happened there is that the few uh, public uh, restrooms that were there, they've been removed. So um, I'm thinking there's something here with the, the, the traditional streets. They need to develop their functions in terms of maybe charging stations, uh, free Wi-Fi. Um, you see what I mean? Could you say something about that, the, the, the mall versus the, mm. the, the local street? Yes, this is a, a, a very good uh, set of observations and, and a good question. In the US, we have a... 60 or 70 year history with suburban shopping malls. They are based on th a large number of people in the population owning their own cars. Um, people who do not have their 
own cars find it difficult to go to suburban shopping malls. That doesn't mean that low-income people from the city never go to suburban shopping malls, but in the US, it does make it difficult for them to go there. Uh, suburban shopping malls uh, off, uh, in the US uh, also are uh, even more policed by private security guards than are uh, city streets. So, uh, if, if there is a political protest or an attempt to use uh, suburban shopping malls for political expression in the US, that's not allowed. I'm not saying that's bad, I'm just pointing out that it's not allowed. It's not a fully public space. All of the, um, all of the services that are provided that you mentioned and other services are provided because the private owner of the shopping mall makes the decision to provide them. In the US also, it has been uh, recognized in the past 10 years at least that there are too many shopping malls mm -hmm. and there are many shopping malls that have gone out of business or shopping malls that have so many empty stores that the owner has transformed them into some other sort of space, like a college campus, or uh, I don't know because I don't study shopping malls and I haven't really looked at them since the early 2000s, but I know that there, there are, have been too many suburban shopping malls. Aesthetically, uh, there has been a shift uh, to design um, according to the principles of new urbanism, suburban shopping spaces that look more like city streets and less like those big malls that, you know, that we're very used to seeing. Um, so I'm not sure that suburban shopping malls always are culturally, socially, and economically successful. I do understand that the weather gets cold, especially with climate change, especially in northern places like, like Sweden. It might be more comfortable for people to shop indoors in the, in the winter time. Of course, in the United States, the shopping malls were air conditioned from the 1960s on. This is environmentally not sustainable, perhaps, in terms of heating and, and air conditioning. I don't know whether it would be more environ environmentally sustainable to return to the architecture of small stores that are individually heated or whether there should be actually, as you, as you were suggesting, some environmental refitting of local shopping streets. So there would be electric charging stations for electric car, electricity charging stations for electric cars. Or if we have, as people speak about today, uh, driverless cars or self-driving cars, maybe that will give the opportunity to local shopping streets to reimagine themselves into a completely new transportation, urban transportation system. I don't know, I, I, you know, I find it difficult personally to imagine cities built around driverless cars, but uh, venture capitalists whom I have interviewed in connection with my current research project are seriously talking about cities that where nobody own, owns a car anymore and we don't have parking lots that are you know, or parking meters or anything like that. So uh, maybe we maybe urban designers should be thinking about the reimagining of local shopping streets in this you know, new, new future of, uh, of cities. Thank you very much for your talk. Uh, I would like to continue with the last point that you made about urban designers continuing with local shops. Uh, while you were presenting, I'm think, I was thinking about the city I come from, Tehran, which has local um, shops, uh, strong history and culture of local shops and streets which we, we were 
having uh, memories of buying new only for New Year's shoes or streets which are only for repairing cars and then through transitions quite diverse streets and now almost every single development which is happening in the city is taking this sort of model and having small shops or bigger shops and to, to create that sort of vibes and diversity and not only because of global goods but uh, because of the whole economic and political situation uh, this is not simply working and uh, the, of course the physical structure is trying to create that sort of uh, vibe but uh, so I would like to ask you as a local shop what else shopping could be meant what else mm -hmm. like what other goods maybe this local shop could um, could provide that uh, for the cities that are still not are, chal are facing different challenges is there any other uh, sort of image that we can have from local shops well this is a good question maybe there are local variations um, I think, for example, of the old quarter in Hanoi in Vietnam, where the shopping streets have histories hundreds of years old. The names of the streets still reflect the old uses, the, str the street of silk merchants, maybe in Tehran it's the same thing, the street of, I can't, I, I can't remember now the names of the difference, the street of silversmiths and so on. Uh, and sometimes the the contemporary shops still sell um, specialized products like those old products. I know uh, uh, there's one street in the old quarter of, of Hanoi where people go to buy mattresses and and quilts and sheets and so on. And you, you know that, that's still that kind of specialization still exists. On the other hand. Where I live in, in New York, I see more and more people are, are asked to, by advertisements, to buy their sheets online. Mm -hmm. So what does that do to the idea that there might be an, an interesting small street of small shops that sell sheets and blankets and pillows if, if people you know, can go to one website or they can use one app to buy all of all, everything they need, uh, from a bed to a mattress to a sheet to to a pillow. So I, you know, I, I find this really a just you know a, a huge puzzle, and and I don't know what what people will tolerate, right? I mean, I I can say I like these specialized streets, but I I I don't know what people will tolerate. And you know, you young people, for example. Uh, maybe you would prefer to buy your sheets through an app. I mean, why waste time? Uh, you could be doing Facebook or something. You know, why, why waste time to go to a, a store and, um, and this store and then that store and a third store to put together your, your furniture? And I, you know, I, I, I understand that people, especially different generations, uh, develop different ways of satisfying their needs, but Overall, as human settlements, I think we really need these kinds of spaces that have been shopping spaces or marketplaces for a very long time. For you know, as long as we have had cities, we have had these spaces for specialized merchants and merchandise. Um, so, you know, I, I just don't know what speaks to people. Every uh, you know, almost every new shop that opens is a restaurant or a cafe. And uh, I'm sure that there is an overbuilding of these shops, just as there has been an overbuilding of suburban shopping malls. I don't know. You mentioned the new urbanism movement and uh, uh, I mean, when you look at their first 20 years, they were extremely influential and I would say progressive. And now I think, I wouldn't say they're regressive, but mm -hmm. for me, shockingly, mm -hmm. nothing is happening. Mm -hmm. And these issues of gentrification to planet urbanization have been very, have, have not been taken on board uh, at all in the, in the sort of proper way or the way they deserve. Uh, and of course, their iconic figure is Jane Jacobs. And mm -hmm. you have had been a scholar that has been nuanced, looking in a nuanced way at her work. And if we look at, if we say that maybe um, 
the barometer of a uh, healthy city living is urban vitality. And if, of course, one has to take into account the time that Jane Jacobs lived, but recently there's been articles, a couple years ago actually, by Joel Kotkin and Margaret Crawford, who have looked at Jane's work from, from two very different perspectives, saying that maybe she didn't really understand the issues of diversity and race. Uh, she was, according to them, much more influential than relevant. And if you look at Her Herbert Gans's work on uh, the urban villagers and that, that was much more to understand Absolutely. the sort of the class issue. Absolutely. Uh, so why? Why was, uh, why didn't she understand that? What was missing in her work? Great question. I tried to take this up in the first chapter of my book, Naked City. Uh, and it's, it's difficult to criticize Jane Jacobs because she is really regarded now as such a saint. Uh, and of course, her writing is so powerful. I mean, I wish I could write like that. It's really fantastic, strong, very concrete writing. And most important for us professors, no footnotes. Right? No sources. If you look at the death and life of great American cities, there are not even one footnote. Well, maybe, you know, a few little things at the bottom of the page. But, and she wrote for, uh, for corporate magazines, right? She was, uh, she was not writing for radical social critique or something like, like that. And, and in fact, her, I believe her, her, politi her political ideology was not uh, you know, standard left-wing politics, it was more uh, a, a, a negative reaction to state control, uh, which, reflected the, the, uh, re which reflected her time period and her specific point of view. You're quite right that Herb Gans, who is still alive today and, and active, uh, the sociologist Herb Gans had a very different point of view. Uh, Jacobs for many years I think was not influential and then perhaps uh, after 20 or 30 years she developed a large readership and group of supporters among urban planners and urban designers. And then people said, oh, Jane Jacobs was fantastic. At the same time, 20 years after she published The Death and Life of Great American Cities in the 1980s then, gentrifiers began to say, wow, great, we like small shops. This is, you know, old buildings, this is fantastic. I mean, when, you know, when she wrote aesthetically, she was quite radical. Um, she had friends who, uh, and, and associates who were involved in the same kinds of movements uh, in East Harlem and in the East Village who were more politically radical than, uh, than she was. Um, so I think it's, uh, you know, her, the respect for her and even the, the great admiration for her came very late. And it came at the same time as people uh, associated with gentrification were buying properties in, in neighborhoods with old buildings and small shops. Uh, one of her ideas I think is very important. Uh, why didn't she write about race? Well, you know, her friends and acquaintances who were active in East Harlem and the East Village were speaking about race and ethnicity and social class. I don't know, you know, uh, in the West Village, why she, in, in her neighborhood, why she, why, you know, she had a different emphasis, but, uh, and she did, she did write uh, in, in a few places in the death and life of great American cities about uh, majority black neighborhoods, but that really was not a, you're right, that was not a, a big part of her, of her, uh, of her work. Uh, where she was accepted the most was in her principles of design, uh, where she supported old, a mix of old buildings and new buildings. Of course, the reason she supported that mix of old buildings and new buildings was because that would keep the rents down. The old buildings would, would be charging lower rents and, and you could get startups uh, in those old buildings because they could not afford to pay higher uh, higher rents. Um, it, it's interesting though, for all the respect and admiration for Jane Jacobs, including on the part of New York City's former um, uh, urban, pla uh, urban planning commissioner, city planning commissioner, 
in the Bloomberg administration, uh, her Jane Jacobs' opinion had absolutely no influence in one particular rezoning in 2005, the rezoning of the waterfront of Williamsburg and Greenpoint in Brooklyn. Jane Jacobs wrote a letter to the city council saying, please do not rezone this area. There needs to be manufacturing. There needs to be space for manufacturing to provide jobs for relatively unskilled workers, particularly for those workers who still live in, that, in those two neighborhoods. And the city council completely ignored her, her, her letter. Um, they had much stronger motivations to rezone the waterfront for high-rise uh, residential construction, which led to the, uh, the building of luxury housing along the waterfront. So yeah, Jane, Jane Jacobs. Uh, I met her, well, I'm just gonna add one small example. I met her only once, uh, about one year before she died. She came to a seminar uh, at City College, the urban design program in the architecture school at City College, which is part of my university. And uh, I was invited to be in a seminar where she spoke the day after she gave a big lecture. And I asked her, you know, how could we, how could we uh, protect the interests of small business owners? She said, we should make it easier for them to get mortgages so they could buy the buildings where they have their stores. And I thought, this is a terrific idea. But wait a second, this shows that all of us, all of us are limited in what we can imagine. Because that must have been in 2005, when the financial crisis broke two years later, one of the big problems was that people had had signed up for mortgages that they could not have paid that they could not afford to pay for, so maybe that's not such a good idea. Even Jane Jacobs maybe was limited, and we're all limited in you know what we can imagine uh, as a good solution to a problem. Uh, I was wondering if you've looked at uh, the reverse process of gentrification. So instead of um, uh, new shops uh, changing the character of a street, so the arriving, the, the landing of new uh, shops, uh, if by a process of redesigning, especially uh, uh, turning uh, uh, streets into pedestrian areas, uh, have triggered a process of gentrification by first changing the street, public space, let's say, and then, uh, um, yeah, like starting a transformation of the economical system of the street. And then also another question, where would you, uh, like in your uh, research, what would you consider the, the limit of the street is? Have you been looking at the shops, at the interior space of the shop as a part of the street? Or because I, I, as far as I remember, Suzanne Hall that you mentioned, I think she has been looking at at a certain depth of the structure of the shops and showed how uh, this depth, uh, so the, more, the further you go from the street, uh, the more you find different or new uh, net economical uh, systems and social networks that happen not at the forefront of the street but actually on the backside. Uh, and this is also part of this whole economical system of the street, so in a more complex uh, urban depth or something like that. Okay, now I have to remember what was your first question. Uh, uh, the opposite pro redesign of the street. Oh. You know, in New York City, our uh, system of urban planning is so weak compared to European cities that usually there is a remaking of the landscape of the street after the stores have changed, not, be not before. After real estate developers have made their investment and built new buildings, then there is a, a change of the landscape. Uh, if you have traveled to New York recently, perhaps you have seen landscaping in the middle of the Bowery and a reshaping of um, the area of, of the street that is devoted to cars in contrast to the area of the street that is sidewalks and, and green space for pedestrians uh, south of 8th Street, which is near, near where I live. 
Uh, but this has followed real estate development, not preceded it. So it's you know a little bit too strange uh, for a New Yorker to think about think about the landscaping causing change in the use of space. Where you know we usually <laughs> we have it backwards in in New York. Um, in, in Amsterdam and, and in some other uh, cities, the change of landscape comes before, um, and then you know, maybe there's a change in the use of the space and the change of the businesses, and then more real estate investment or change in real estate investment. Um, so you know, there are really variations. What I found in a very uh, simple way is that whether this, the change comes from the markets, or the change comes from local government, the result has been the same. And you know, this is like my very simple one sentence uh, conclusion to the transnational research project. My gosh, you know, uh, differences, but the streets have changed in the same way. So that's, that gives you a lot to think about in the, in, in the future for making future urban changes. Let's see, your second question. Now I forgot your second question after I remembered your first <laughs> question, so please remind me. Uh, if you've been looking also at the, um, at the interior of the ship. Oh, the right, yes, yeah, right, right, yes. Oh. Okay, so I had a, a, a very wonderful day a few years ago. Uh, Suzanne Hall invited me to, uh, to participate in a workshop at LSE, and she took uh, my colleague and me for a personal walk on Rye Lane in Peckham, uh, which was not the first street that she wrote about, but the second street that she wrote about. And we looked at the street, we looked at the stores on the street, she told us interesting stories about the stores, and then we went into the, uh, the spaces that were sort of uh, uh, shopping malls, and not really, but maybe four or five businesses inside the courtyards of the, the shops. So, I don't know how far inside I would go. I definitely would go inside the, the interior of, of shops. Uh, I would look at the interactions between people, uh, as, as she did in her book, uh, City, Street, and what, Nation. Um, I don't know if I would go upstairs, uh, but I would definitely look at the building owners and the decisions that the building owners make and I have looked at the decisions of the Merchants Association or the Street Association or the Business Improvement District if there is such an association on that street because that group of people governs the street. And that group of people is very influential in determining who belongs on the street. Maybe they don't you know, come up to a person and say, you <laughs> leave the street, but they, they create an atmosphere that is welcoming or not welcoming to different groups of people. Uh, when I did research in the 1990s for my book, The Cultures of Cities, I looked at business improvement districts in New York City, which were just in their early years. At that point, they were already making decisions about the signs on the street, and they decided the size and the colors and so on of, of the signs on the street because they wanted to make a greater aesthetic coherence. Uh, and that was a way of showing the street would be upscaled. This is the same thing on Javastrat in Amsterdam, where the city government decided that there were too many immigrants, the street was looking like a ghetto, according to them, ghetto, uh, and uh, it was such a socially problematic area that they had to change the uses of space, they had to change the stores. Uh, it, you know, the, the similar mechanisms to Paris and Berlin and uh, maybe in Scandinavian cities also. So um, the, uh, the city government provided a street manager. In, on the other street, the upscale street, the city government really didn't care what was happening and the merchants themselves collected money to hire a street manager. 
Uh, but on the problematic street where there were a lot of immigrant owned shops, the city government gave them a street manager. And her task was to transmit to the building owners and to the store owners the ideas of the city government about what the street should be. One of the rules was that the city government said the colors of the store facades on that street had to be the classical colors that you would find in the cultural heritage Part, uh, uh, streets or neighborhoods of Amsterdam, cream color and uh, black and dark green. I mean, they're very handsome colors, but they create an atmosphere, a certain kind of atmosphere. Uh, and in fact, there was a kind of uh, gentrifying, uh, I forget what it was, a juice store owner, cafe owner, bookshop owner, who had painted his facade bright colors like pink and yellow and blue. He had to repaint. Um, so, it, you know, that rule affected gentrifying store owners as well as immigrant store owners. Uh, also, the street manager on that street, on Javastrat, went into the immigrant-owned fruit and vegetable stores. Uh, I should say the city government said there were too many fruit and vegetable stores. And they, she went into the fruit and vegetable stores and said they had to make a more exotic display of ingredients, that it wasn't good to have all these tomatoes on the street. So, uh, yes. <laughs> Uh, it, it, it's interesting. Uh, it's interesting how these the, the creation of rules, even design rules, has a has a social effect. We have time for two more. Hi. Um, great talk. Thank you very much. Um, what I'm thinking, at least in my mind, is I come from a Canadian city. That's, I mean, it's a capital city of a province, but it's not. A, Montreal, Ottawa, uh, which, Vancouver. Which city is that? Winnipeg. Oh, Winnipeg. Okay. Yeah. So it's dead center, um, cold. But um, I think particularly of one street, I could name it, but it probably won't mean much to many people, um, where in effect here we've talked a lot about streets in which people are displaced and it's upscaling. Where in this street I'm thinking of, uh, it's in fact the opposite. I think in as recent as the 70s, uh, it was kind of the archetype of the, the shopping market street you were talking about, where there's butchers, uh, mattress shops, lamp stores, whatever. Um, and now, many of those stores are boarded up. Um, you can see in some way that there's, there's some evidence still of it, but it, it's not exactly a popular place. And it's been replaced with a lot of these ethnic food stores, um, uh, a totally different population, of course. Now, my question is, is if we're going to bring some life back into the city, because, I mean, it's maybe only every, every third window, for instance, it's an actual business. The rest are, the rest are boarded up. Um, which should we be aiming for? Should we be aiming to liven the ethnic community that's already there, a lot of new immigrants, um, a lot of refugee communities, or should we be looking back um, to its, I mean, it's still fairly recent in the 70s, but looking back to this more um, mom and pop stores, I think would be the, the term that's often used. So in this small time scale or time span, we have two communities, and it was people moving in and out rather recently, um, and I guess, which is sort of the model according to you, or do you think that is um, how it should be sort of relivened, or, or which is the ideal, I suppose? The, the history you describe sounds a little bit like the history of one of the Toronto streets that my Toronto research partners talked about um, in, the pa in the past, maybe not, not today. And again, you know, I, I, I tried to evoke my childhood experience of devalorization of spaces, uh, of shopping spaces. So, you know, wh what you describe 
happens, right? You know, we don't, we don't all live on a, on a line that's going up, 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 uh, whether that line is rents or progress or prosperity. We, you know, things, things vary, right? Conditions, conditions vary. Um, I, I, I have to say uh, uh, that people who do not, people who might be new migrants, who do not speak the dominant language well, may find it uncomfortable to shop in small stores where the shop owner represents the, the dominant population of the country or, or of the city. Maybe they feel that they're under surveillance. Maybe they feel that the shop owner is criticizing them or doesn't want to help them. Uh, maybe they would feel comfortable with an owner from their group. Maybe, maybe not. Maybe they prefer to go to the supermarket. Maybe we've all had the experience of being a foreigner who does not speak the language, like me in Sweden, for example, and I might feel more comfortable going to a supermarket where I see what's on the shelf and I can choose what's on the shelf without trying to find the language to ask for it. Right? And I can compare prices and, and, and so on and not feel that anybody's looking at me because of the scale of the store and the transparency of the, the products and the exchange, exchanges. Um, I do think it's, I, I do think it's a, an, an interesting economic opportunity for a neighborhood to be enlivened by helping entrepreneurs from the residential community. And I don't know what the specific tools might be best in different circumstances. Um, if there's a very poor population, they might find it hard to pay prices in any individually owned shop. Um, if there's a crime problem in the neighborhood, it might be difficult for store owners to operate. Maybe insurance companies won't want to insure the store. I, I don't know. Uh, my Toronto research partners wrote about immigrant-owned shops that create safe spaces for children, for example, to, to come uh, you know, and, and hang out there. Um, I th you know, again, I think that might be a great situation for experimenting with community organizations. What's needed? What kinds of activities are needed? Is, is, should there be a mix of social welfare activities and educational activities, libraries, public libraries, and shops? What, you know, what, what's a safe space? Are there women from the immigrant communities who need their own safe spaces? And, you know, and, and I say that as somebody who is a, a supporter of gender equality, but in some cultures, women might, might need their own safe spaces. Women and children, perhaps, might need their own safe spaces. So that would be, for, for, for me, who has no practical responsibility in politics whatsoever. For me, that would be a great opportunity to try to get building owners together with local banks, and maybe not local in that district, but you know, local in the city, and uh, community organizations to try to make some lively spaces. Oh, and I forgot to say urban designers, too. I'm conscious of the needs of my audience, right? Urban designers, too. Okay. Okay, I think we are, we're at the end. I just had a micro question. I just came from Boston, and it was in the North End, which Jane Jacobs celebrated so much. Mm. And it looks intact, but is little Italy's disappearing from American cities? Great question. <laughs> the Italians in New York have moved out of the two little Italys. Long ago, they moved out. Uh, one of them is a very strong commercial tourist area surrounded by Chinatown. The other is a very strong Italian commercial uh, center, primarily selling Italian foods, but many of the business owners are Albanians and Mexicans. So yeah, uh, the people change, the people change. change. Okay. 
Thank you so much, Sharon, and thank, thank you, you, Chuck, for, for the reflections, thank and thank you all thank of you. you. Yeah.